and they saw a good mother there. They saw somebody willing to fight for her child. And the same year that that movie came out, the Milal School, which is devoted to children with autism, was constructed in a nice neighborhood in Seoul, but bricks were thrown at the windows. Wires, electrical wires and telephone wires were cut, and the zoning board withdrew permission for the building to be completed. It seemed that nobody in the neighborhood wanted a school for autistic children to be around them. A compromise was made that allowed the building to go forward, uh, but uh, that compromise meant that there would be no windows to the exterior so that nobody would have the opportunity to actually see a child with autism. Um, all the windows would just face the interior of the school. And within a matter of about three years, after the marathon movie, after our study, which hasn't even been published yet, by the way, uh, got a lot of press, there's been a big change. Today, that school, the Milal School, is a jewel in that neighborhood. And most people who live in the community volunteer there. They have their community events there, their voting booths there. I mean, they're very much involved. And so it's a very different situation now in a very short amount of time. And I see this kind of change in my own daughter, Isabel, here when she was very young and wanted to be Linnea in Monet's garden, if you know the famous children's story, and stand on Monet's bridge at Giverny. Isabel was born at a time of low autism awareness, and then she now lives at a time of great autism awareness. And I can't say that I am ever jealous of somebody who has a child with autism, but I am definitely in awe of the opportunities and the possibilities for people now versus 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Isabel's 19 now, and she's really benefited, benefited from the growth in the prevalence of autism. Look at um, the National Institute of Mental Health. From a, you know, a few million dollars in the early 90s, it's now investing millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in autism, which is remarkable. You know, it's actually really remarkable is the name, uh, now that I think of it. Um, you know, the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, most of the institutes are named after the diseases that they study. So the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Substance Abuse, Drug Abuse, National Institutes of Strokes and Neurological Disorders, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Why isn't it called the National Institute of Mental Illness? Maybe because there still is stigma. There still is so much stigma associated with psychiatry and that psychiatrists know that with people not treated, that they need to do everything they can to get people into care. They know that despite their best efforts, people with a mental illness or a psychiatric condition suffer two illnesses. They suffer from the illness itself, but they also suffer from the burden of stigma. Society's fears and judgments, the branding, the marking that takes place. I've seen my daughter grow up at a time of rapidly decreasing stigma. And that has translated into her own, her own life. She's been given opportunities that she never would have had before. And I just want to tell you about a couple of them. You know, not because I want to generalize from my anecdotes to anybody else's and say that my daughter's experiences can be generalized to anybody else's because we know how different children are on the autism spectrum. But Isabel wanted to work at the zoo. And she said to me once, a couple of years ago, I want to go to the, I said, you know, where, what are we going to do for the summer? What are you going to do? And she said, I want to go to the zoo. And she, I think, may have meant something more than just visiting one time. By the way, she's been to the London Zoo three times in the past two days. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so I went to the volunteer office at the National Zoo, and I said, do you have anything where my daughter could volunteer? She would even mop the floors. She just likes to be in a zoo environment. 
And they said, oh, sure, you know, you can have uh, your daughter come to uh, the um, informational session, and then she just has to write a short essay, and then if we like her, we'll interview her. And I said, you know, wait a minute, my child has autism. She can't do that. And the woman didn't miss a beat. And she said, well, okay, then um, uh, I understand. Uh, why don't we uh, have a special meeting with her, and you can just bring her here, and I'll interview her. And I brought Isabel. The woman spoke with her, seemed to like her, and then suggested to me that Isabel come and walk around with the class of five-year-olds who were at the zoo, summer zoo day camp and make sure they don't get lost. And I said, I don't think she can do that. She's going to look at the animals. She's going to be over here and over here and over here. And there's a little five-year-old who's going to rush off and you can't. And, she, and you know, the woman said, I understand, but let's try it and we'll supervise and we'll shadow her and see if she can do it. How on earth she had faith in my daughter, I have no idea, because normally parents are telling people, my kid can do more than you think. It doesn't usually happen the other way around. <laughs> and so Isabel went there, and uh, I, I expected a telephone call you know, within an hour. But I, I, I picked her up a few hours later, and they said she did a marvelous job. She knows all the kids' names already. And she made sure to round them up and make sure that they got herded together. And, and, you know, I underestimated my own daughter. My daughter loves toys. She loves uh, Pokemon. She loves Disney dolls. She loves Barbie dolls. She loves Thomas the Tank Engine. Whatever it is, and she actually never loses anything because she loves them, and they all have to be in a set. And these kids for her, I'm sure of it, they, they, were, they were a coherent set for her. She learned their names right away. You know, we could, we could say, okay, maybe she objectified these kids, but she did her job. And she did her, and she was able to be at the zoo, and she did her job probably better than a non-autistic person would have done. Now, two years later, we decided that Isabel should try to get involved in some kind of work. And so she's 18 years old, and we found that she could volunteer potentially at uh, an animal laboratory where scientists were doing research on lab animals, mice and rats and uh, marmosets and um, rhesus monkeys. And they took her on. Uh, that she could, she could clean the cages and she could help to feed the animals. And she's very good with recipes. So you could get, sell her you know, so many sunflower seeds and so many marshmallows or whatever. And I, I don't know that's what they eat, but you know, mix them together. And um, we decided uh, that that would be great. And uh, we would try it out. And they asked us if we could come in for an orientation, which my wife and I assumed would be an orientation uh, of the sort where you're shown the bathroom and you're shown the coat rack and the entrance and the exit and where you might eat lunch. We get there and they've set up a conference room with all the veterinary staff. And then there's a seat for Isabel and for my wife and me. And they go around the room and they start saying what they did. I, you know, I got my PhD in veterinary this or that at the University of Colorado and on and on and on. And I look at my wife and I give her a look that says, my God, what are they thinking? And it gets around to Isabel. We had prepared her for this, of course. And it gets around to Isabel, and uh, we think she's going to say something maybe about Thomas the Tank Engine. We just didn't know. And she somehow understood that this was a setting in which you said things about yourself that were positive. She got that. She somehow inferred that. And she said, my name's Isabel Grinker. I'm very pretty. She said that to you, Jude, the other night, right? She said, my name's Isabel Grinker. I'm very pretty. I go to high school, and I'm full of autism. <laughs> I'm full of autism. I don't know where she heard that phrase from. And what happened was that the tension in the room, I mean, I, I don't know if there was tension there to begin with, but I certainly felt tense. It just <laughs> deflated. And suddenly, the word autism was out, and it was there. And so the next thing, somebody in the room said, oh, well, you know, I know some autistic people are sensitive to certain types of light or sound. Is there anything we should know about? And it's, it, it snowballed like that into a discussion about autism, and then in Temple Grandin and her works and so on. And it was this lovely, open feeling of discussing my daughter not as a stigmatized, um, 
judged person with a disorder, but as a distinctive individual. And the thing that was the most moving, of course, to me is that she didn't have that stigma. She didn't have that sense of stigma. She said, I am full of autism. That was a statement to us and to the group of people that she's been now working with for many months, successfully, I might add, that I, I, I am who I am. I'm proud of who I am. And having autism makes me good at art, or it makes me good at, at being with animals. It makes me good at something. Well, I don't think we would ever have gotten to this situation that we're in now if it hadn't been for all of the multiple changes acting in concert, whether it's the work of epidemiologists, the growth of psychiatry, the growth of play therapists, the growth of, of special education, of uh, ABA, of all the interventions and, and, and the, the ideas that people bring to try and help nurture children and help them to develop. Teachers and schools and principals and staff and dedicated, I mean it's unbelievable to me when you think about the dedication and the devotion and the amount of work that people in every country in the world now put toward helping children to develop. And so that's why that's why I think it is a better time than ever to be autistic now. That's why I think it is a better time than ever for people with mental illness in general. And why you can go ahead and accuse me of being a Pollyanna, but my personal experience, my research experience is telling me that we are actually doing something right. And I think that's where I'll end today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much.